And if people join in, you'll be able to let them in. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. So yeah, let's get into it. This is yeah. Yeah. So this is a this is a revenue neutral shift um, from property taxes to land value taxes. How that would work, and this is the culmination of Harris and I working over the last uh, few months now, uh, putting together this wonderful presentation and data analysis for you. Yeah. Um, could you? Yeah. So um, uh, two of the really biggest crises affecting our city and our country, and will be defining crisis of the next decade and century, is our climate crisis and our housing crisis. These two crises are are very much linked and will be linked together for whatever choices we make. And every government from local to national government should be using every tool in their toolbox to confront these crises head on. And one of the biggest tools that any municipality has is their ability to tax. We need a tax structure that actually confronts these crises head on so that we can actually make a better life for all of our citizens. So one way we can do that, of course, is the land value tax. But the other question is, where what is land value? Where does land value come from, right? So there's a technical definition and there's the more lame definition that uh, we're all more aware of. So I, I wanna get the technical definition out of the way to make sure we're all on the same page here. So in economics, we define land value or land rent or interchangeable. It's the marginal difference in the productivity between that plot of land that you're looking at and the least productive plot of land in existence. So for example, Hopefully you all can see if you have two plots of land that are about equal size, the right next to each other, or whatever, right? And if one of them working the same amount of work, same amount of exertion over the course of a year can produce you $100 in wealth. And if another one can only produce you $20 in wealth, let's say this one has just like the desert, the soil stops, you can't grow anything on it, whatever, right? The difference between these two is about $80 in productivity. Now, if I am a private landowner, and I own this one, and you want to come up and you want to work on this land and produce $100 worth of wealth, right? What I can do is I can charge you the difference between what you can produce on this plot of land and this plot of land, which is $80. What that will do is that will leave you indifferent between working on this plot of land, since you would be left over, of course, with $20 in wealth at the end. Working here, you pay, I mean, you, you make $20. You pay nothing in rent, right? Leaving you, of course, with $20 in the end. So that is where the actual, like, number, the numerical value of the rent comes from. It's the difference between these two. Because that difference, right, that is what this landowner is able to capture from you. Charge any more, and you're left off with less than if you were working at the inferior plot, right? So again, just to be clear, this is the maximum amount of rent that you can charge, that this landowner can charge from you. After you producing $100 in wealth, paying $80 to work on that highly productive plot of land, leaving you with only 20, right? And so what makes the difference between these two plots of land and productivity? Like what, what goes into that, right? So this is where we get into things like population, right? The more people there are in a location, right? The more productive that place is because you get to take advantage of subdivision of labor, which allows for specialization, right? The reason why there is a large tech center on most West Coast cities is because there is a large population, right? A village of 100 people would not be able to support a tech worker, right? But with a million people or, you know, thousands of people in a place, you can. Other things like geography, right? Like the soil, for example, location, proximity to uh, to water or transport goods or just, you know, uh, interaction with more people, that kind of thing. Zoning, that also, of course, affects land values usually in the negative side of things. Single family zoning, for example, is probably the best use example of this as depressing land values because the government is saying you can do less with that land than you otherwise could, right? And then of course, um, government infrastructure, building public transit, trains, bike lanes, bus lanes, that kind of thing. Um, those all increase land values. They make the people in the area more productive, able to produce more wealth with the same exertion. And then of course, technological progress, right? That also increases uh, the amount of wealth that can be produced um, at, a, at a given location. Um, and then, so what does this actually look like in Seattle's case, right? Well, we have a, a very lovely map for Seattle and King County, actually, of what land value looks like here. So let's just explain the scale real quick, right? So this dark stuff, these parcels is where um, the land value approaches is around $22,000 or so, $2,000 or so per square foot, okay? And then on the lower end of things, we're getting down to like less than $25 per square foot. So you see some obvious trends here, right? Downtown Seattle, 
uh, Belltown, Uptown, that kind of thing. Really high land value. Same going on with Bellevue, right? Um, you also see, of course, like U District, Ballard. Um, there's some obvious trends too, right? Like you can see waterfront properties, right? Incredibly high value as well. Um, so this kind of makes sense, right? Like places that are really dense, have really good government infrastructure, uh, not those exclusively, but those you know tie into it, as well as zoning allows for more uh, more productive use of that land. You can do more with it. You can produce more with it, right? Um, and so that's this is also I should caveat by the way. This is according to King County government uh, assessment, right? That's where we get this data from. Um, to quick question: This is purchase value, not uh, rent value. So this is this is rent value. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's and right, right, yeah. Um, this is this is the annual land rent value per square foot. Good question. I should clarify. Um, okay, so to kind of give you an idea of what a tax shift would actually look like, because again, this is this is where land value is. So if we were just taxing land values, this would be the geographic distribution and also the economic distribution, right, of what a land value tax incidence would look like, right. Um, and on that, on the next slide, we have a pretty good visual of what that looks like with different land uses, right? So again, a land value tax only taxes the land. It ignores everything else. And we do this on purpose, and we'll kind of explain why in a bit. But under a current property tax, right, as, as let's just pretend for a moment, right, that all these plots of land are worth the same. The only difference in the property value is, of course, the building on top, right? So as you build more, as you use your land more intensely, as you use it more efficiently, under the current property tax scheme, you pay more in taxes, right? Under a land value tax, it's different. You pay the exact same amount of taxes, no matter what you do with it. And the purpose of that, of course, it being you know land use agnostic, is that it disincentivizes doing nothing with it and incentivizes you doing something with it. Or I guess more accurately, it doesn't punish you for doing something with your land. Um, and then of course, the one after this, we can you, you see what a what a shift would look like for more highly valuable land, right? Where um, if you want to maintain the same amount of revenue or increase it, right? You'd also obviously have to raise the rates. So for empty lots, for example, and this it doesn't always pan out like this one to one in real life. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Um, you see a pretty significant increase in your tax burden, right? Because you're not doing anything with that land, um, and then and since you'd be taxed for you know, holding on to that land again, you get you get a very strong incentive to actually do something with the land rather than holding on to it empty for speculation or whatever sort of nefarious purposes. Which gets us on to our next uh, part of it of uh, one of the main impacts of land value tax before we start talking about revenue and stuff is about its impact on land speculation as a business. Now, as you increase your land value tax rate, as you capture more and more of that land rent, which by the way, I really wanna emphasize here, that land rent is publicly created, right? It comes from the people, it comes from government infrastructure, it comes from our, the community, right? As you increase that, it makes it less and less possible for you to do land speculation. Because the price of land, and this is kind of simplified, but this is the core of it, right? The price of a plot of land ultimately comes down to the land value, the land rent, what you can get out of that plot of land, the, the privileges, the monopoly, that you get from that minus the costs of it. And when you, if you were to go all the way to 100% land value tax, right, where you capture the full value of that land, the full rent, the costs, the tax, right, will end up being equal to the land value itself. And so you're not able to purchase a plot of land, sit on it, let the community do all the hard work, make that location more valuable, more productive, more desirable, and then cash in on someone else's work, right? So instead, Price goes down as a result of this, right? Although, you know, land values are still able to, you know, go up as the community works, right? Um, and just in general, as, as, as I said before, right, as the tax rate increases, right, the cost of holding onto that plot of land increases, which forces you to either do something with it or sell it off to someone who will do something with it, right? And this is, uh, this is Dallas, I think. Houston, Houston, Houston. Yeah, this is downtown Houston in like the 1970s, absolutely demolished and destroyed for the country, right? Um, but under a land value tax, not quite as possible, or at least it becomes incredibly expensive to do this, right? Um, yeah, and because that sort of thing becomes incredibly expensive, you get some really nice uh, land efficiency or land use efficiency, um, as we talk about here. Yeah, so uh, land value tax rewards um, 
uh, land efficiency, which is really, really good. So for instance, you look at this island, you can consider this to be your state, you consider it to be your city, your country. Um, when you're thinking about building out, building more, more homes, you, under property tax, you can build as many home, 100 homes as you, as many homes as you want, and it's only going to scale with how many homes you make. Whereas with land value tax, it only matters about how, about how much land you have. So if you, the more land you take up, the more your taxes are going to go up. Where it, So in this case, uh, somebody who wants to make 100 homes would be incentivized to make an apartment building instead of destroying all the forest on this island. Uh, because the more land they get, the more they have to pay in taxes. And uh, the other part of this is, is that, you know, this has to do with our climate crisis as well. King, King County, one of the biggest, one of our biggest sins when it comes to climate change is our land use policy. Every time people want to move to Seattle, we have to expand out into our forests. And those forests are like the biggest carbon sinks in the world. And we're expanding out into that. And with every 120 degree day in Phoenix, Arizona, several thousand people are going to say Seattle's looking a lot nicer. And that's the truth is that a lot of places around the world are going to become somewhat unlivable in the next few decades. A lot more people are going to move here. We need to, we need to make sure that we can accommodate millions of more people in the Pacific Northwest, especially in King County, where there's a huge city waiting for them, which means we, and that means that we can't keep sprawling out into the forest. We need to be doing infill. We need to be taking land that's already in the middle of the city and doing more stuff with it, having more people in the city, which means more tall apartment buildings rather than single family homes sprawling out into nature. So uh, I found this on uh, Twitter. This is uh, a demonstration of how property tax encourages poor land use. Uh, so you see that these seven parking lots only pay a quarter of what that apartment is doing. What's doing more for the community here? that apartment building, right? These parking lots are not doing much and they're, it's, it's a complete waste of land in an otherwise pretty important city. Uh, so what should we be rewarding here? Making homeless for people or making just flat tarmac that a car occupies every once in a while? The other nice thing about land value tax is it does punish improvements. So your land value tax remains the same on a given plot of land no matter what you do with it. So if you leave it, if you leave it empty, tax will be two thousand dollars. If you build a hundred story apartment with uh with a hundred apartments in it, your tax remains the same, two thousand dollars. So there's no reason for you not to do as much with your land as possible. This means that you're going incentivized, will no longer put no longer punished for making housing, businesses, industry, jobs. And the other nice part about this is um improvements don't have to be necessarily what you build. If you put in a new countertop in your home, your tax bill goes up because you have more property. You've improved it. If you make a housing unit in your backyard instead of just a gra just grass, your bill goes up, even though you're fixing the housing crisis by making more homes. Um, if you start a business in your garage, your tax bill goes up. These are things that we want to be encouraging our people to do. This is the American dream. This is what we want to happen. So, you know, punishing improvements is bad. And then, so here's a good graphic. So you have the same building on basically the same plot of land and under property tax, guess which one pays more? The one that's better, even though this one's completely fallen into disrepair. It's, it's completely derelict and it's only causing harm to the community. Um, if for those of you who live in Roosevelt, or went to Roosevelt High School. There are these uh, slums that used to be there for several years that were owned by a slumlord named Sisley. Um, he's no longer with us, but the uh, one reason why he let his properties fall into disrepair is his property taxes went down because you know the property's worth less. So there's no incentive for him to make it better. And to this day, it's still actually an empty lot because the it's right next to a light rail station and the land is just appreciating more and more and more. But don't do something with the land or else you have to pay property taxes. That's not what we want around light rail stations. We want to be building housing. We want to be building, especially next to a high school. So this is it's very important.
And, you know, it's a really good segue to this because speaking of government infrastructure, um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, right, you can fund uh, government infrastructure through uh, land value tax, land value capture, right? So a great example of this actually is the New York City Q line extension, right? Everyone talks about how it was like four and a half billion dollar extension. Um, and it, what's up? Oh, was it? Okay, well, you know, most expensive extension is, I'm sure you know, in, I'm pretty sure, transit history, right? And if we measure by like uh, dollars per mile or something, right? And that's always what gets the headlines. But what kind of gets blurred out of the picture is that it created over $7 billion of land value. And all that money, by the way, went to private landowners, right? So public money went into creating publicly created wealth that ended up into private hands. But that publicly created wealth could have gone towards the funding and construction and maintenance of the queue line and, and all other kinds of infrastructure, right? Rather than depending on regressive taxation pay for this, you could do this with capturing publicly created wealth. And you could do this with all kinds of government infrastructure that increases land value, right? Like schools and hospitals and public transit, just anything that makes a place more desirable, more productive, more people wanting to live there. Um, and then uh, on the on next end, uh, with you know, sales taxes and property tax, um, Again, depending on this, as, as opposed to uh, properties and, and sales taxes, because this is a lot more efficient. Um, hit the next slide. So, as we've already talked about, right, property tax punishes improvements and uh, you know making the place better. Um, sales taxes, we're kind of pretty familiar with why sales taxes are really regressive, right? Um, so I'm going to go too much into that about how it you know decreases consumer spending and hurts working families the most, right? Um, whereas with a, a you know a land value tax, right, unlike uh, these taxes uh, does not get passed on to tenants um, as as, consume, as sales taxes and property taxes and most other taxes do since their supplies are elastic. Um, so, uh, and then on the next slide, we'll talk about transition itself. Yeah, so for this project, we want to do a revenue neutral switch. So if we switch from land for property taxes, all the money we currently raise from property taxes, which is... Uh, how much in how many billions of dollars? Oh, shit. The, County, uh, set five and a half billion. Yeah, five and a half billion. Yeah. If we switch that from raised from property taxes to land value taxes in King County, who would win and who would lose? This is what this project is about. So we're going to get into those numbers in just a second. But before we get into that, um, one thing to keep in mind for um, some of the losers who end up paying more in in land value taxes compared to what they would have otherwise paid under property taxes is they actually have more ability to offload those taxes for instance so with under property tax you pay 90 percent of your taxes are from your business like the part of your business that actually makes money and only 10 percent on the parking lot that's the same size right next to it whereas under land value tax 50 percent of your taxes come from the parking lot that's if, assuming that the parking lot and the business are the same footprint so if and if you don't use your parking lot very much and you sell it you get 50 percent tax relief under land value tax compared to your property tax without losing any of your business. So it, it just rewards good land management. So you actually have, the point is you your taxes might go up, but then you have the ability to pay less in taxes if you choose to. So let's get into the numbers. So one more time, this is the land value map of Seattle. And here's a map of who would win and who would lose. Okay. So just so we get an understanding of the scale here. Yellow is where taxes would go down for that parcel, right? Dark yellow is where we see like a very significant 75% or more uh, tax decrease up to 15, 25%, right? Um, and then of course it scales up with the dark, dark green being like, we're talking like 2000% increase or so, right? So again, downtown where land use is pretty well, well used, it's very efficient. You tend to see tax decreases, same deal going on with most of, but some parts of Ballard, right? Um, and other more urbanized uh, places, you can kind of sort of see where the light rail spine is going, right? Um, and then on the opposite end of things, right, where the taxes go up significantly, is where you see very, very poor land use. Um, like for example, Yard Point, right? Where <laughs> we have these sprawling, very large properties on incredibly highly valuable land. And there's also some very interesting um, uh, trends going on that you can see are pretty, pretty much like determined by jurisdictional lines, right? Like Right, you can see exactly where the border of Seattle is, right? And you can see how that's like almost entirely determined by municipality and forest land use, okay? Um, and, and some other, you know, cities where that's the case as well. I will say, just as a little caveat here, right, where you see a lot of these dark green 
uh, massive increases in, in land and in, sorry, and in, in, in tax burden. Um, a lot of that, if you go back to the previous slide real quick, a lot of that's really low land value, right? We're talking like properties that might right now have a two or three hundred dollar a year property tax uh, burden, but under this, that would go up to I guess it was like you know, saying like that would go up to like maybe a thousand dollars. It's the more extreme case, right? Just for context there. Oh, but for sorry, yeah, totally. I just don't know the geography that well. Are we talking like farmland out there? Uh, no, this is all, this is usually, so the farm, farmland goes like here, uh, this up here is, oh yeah, 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 like this area is suburbia, there's yeah, this I mean, whole, these three, I like, areas. agricultural stuff down Yakub. Right, yeah, um, so most of what you're looking at most is mm -hmm. suburbia, yeah, um, and in King County, it's the, the land use and how much is required, like, you know, setback ratios, and what have you, is pretty heinous, um, so anyway, we went to the, Next one, just for one more quick look, um, what the tax shift looks like, right? Um, but on the next slide, you get kind of, I think, a better picture, a very fun histogram. So uh, this is uh, the tax shift for single family homes. So if you talk about an end um, uh, you can look at ind individual single family homes across King County, and 41% of single family homes actually see a tax decrease if we did a revenue neut neutral switch. Um, about, uh, um, a lot would see about an under 30% uh, decrease, uh, increase. And then you start to get to orange is where your taxes effectively double. And then blue is where you see there are some outliers where you would be paying a lot more in taxes. And we don't want people paying five times as much in taxes. So um, one thing that you could do is say you want to do a 30% cap, saying that you wouldn't pay more than 30% extra in taxes compared to what you're paying now. That would cost about five hundred forty-three million dollars to implement. That's a, that's how much land value in taxes revenue that you would potentially be missing out on. And if you wanted to make the cap twenty or ten percent, it would mean that you'd have to take an even bigger hit. That might get up to a billion dollars out of a. But it's a several billion dollar budget, so this would be something that you might be okay with taking a hit on. Um, but that's for for potential policymakers who are watching or might want to implement this at some point. That's something that you need to keep in mind. Here it is for uh, apartments. As you can see, a lot more see their taxes go down because apartments do a lot more with their land. They're more efficient. There's a lot more people paying, able to pay those taxes. Um, so about 56% uh, about of apartments see a tax drop, which is a lot better. And so if you, and um, going up to orange is your taxes doubling or less. So a, ref a deferral, in the same way would be a lot less expensive. Single family homes would be the biggest hit that you'd have to take if you wanted to do a deferral. Here's for parking lots. So for parking lots, we see that they pay a lot more in taxes pretty much across the board. Some of these ones here, these little islands out here are parking lots like this one that are in the middle of downtown, right next to a very high value area. So there are huge buildings around here. And instead of that being office space, housing, stores, restaurants, anything useful, it's just housing for 50 cars that are paying $5 an hour. That's where I do my burnouts. <laughs> yeah, and if you want to do burnouts, it's a great place to go. Uh, so it's just it's just a waste of space. And that's and you'd raise about uh, $23 million in revenue extra by playing a land value tax on parking lots of well. So there's some caveats. Um, King County is not evaluating lots of land correctly, and this is pretty easy to see. For instance, this is a golf course here. It's an empty field, and they're saying that they've actually done more improving on it by leaving it empty, which is just not true. They would they should pay a lot more in land value tax compared to, you know, a building or something. I mean, this could uh, this within this golf course you could house several thousand people, but a golf course is doing better with that land. I don't know how much people are. Paying paying to golf there, but I guarantee it's not that much. This golf course here. Um, yeah, so uh, that's one of them. Uh, zoning depresses land values. If we want to upzone in some places, it'll raise land values there. Um, we would also like to do a sales tax offset. That's a little harder to calculate because it depends on the individual person. If you're more frugal, uh, sales tax doesn't affect you as much. But even though some homes uh, taxes may increase, um, if we also trade off sales tax, the total cost of living may actually come down for them if we did a sales tax 
um, offset as well. So uh, this is just for property tax. It's much easier to calculate. We'd like to do sales tax at some point, but that would require a, a lot more than effort. So uh, just real quick, I uh, just want to talk about the legal side of things. So um, unfortunately, with all good things in the state, it is unconstitutional. Um, sort of. So the main thing that makes it unconstitutional is this uniformity clause, which says that all taxes have to be uniform, right, upon the same class of property. And then they define all real estate as constituting one class. So the Washington state legislature, in its infinite wisdom, has decided that land and buildings are the same thing. And, um, but there is, there is a little bit of a, um, a way around this, one of two ways. If you wanted to amend the constitution, you can make land tax legal by deleting these three words that says devoted to reforestation. So you're allowed to tax mineral and other land resources with a yield tax, that would allow land value tax. That's very difficult though. The other way to do it, and this is quite limiting, but it is allowed right now, which is MFTE. For those who don't know, MFTE is a uh, tax abatement on improvements for uh, for apartment buildings that set aside a certain portion uh, of their units for affordable rates. It's a pretty broken policy, to be honest, in terms of like what those rates are set like, but let's set that aside for now. Um, so if you wanted to, you could expand MFTE jurisdiction to basically every parcel of land or however you want to do that, right? And then the way to do it would be to increase property tax rates and then immediately provide a tax forgiveness on the improvements and you would effectively be doing a land tax which is something that <clears throat> the washington state legislature literally says right they're still paying the tax on the land of course this is still um you know capped out by the one percent cap of uh, increasing property tax rates by the state constitution so there is a bit of a limit in how much you could raise doing it this way right um, the tax shift that we calculated for context that assumes a 1.8% tax on land, right? We're about a 10.8% um, um, or sorry, an 18% uh, tax on land rents, right? So um, it still runs into that cap in terms of generating enough revenue for what we're currently spending. But, um, and I just, I'll, I'll wrap it up with this, which is, you know, assume these legal problems weren't here. I, I, I really do want us to think about like what we could do with the land value tax um, if, if, if we wanted to have nice things. Um, so like, I, I just put it real quick, what, what, what are the tax revenues for, for general fund expenditures for some of the largest uh, government spenders here in King County, right? And under 2023 land values, you could collect $40 billion in land rents, okay? Of that, about $20 billion is just from Seattle alone, okay? Um, so the current Seattle Public School enrollment, okay, is about 49,000 people. So I want to imagine, right, and that's $23,000 per student. I want to imagine taking $5 billion of that $20 billion, okay, that you could collect by taxing publicly created wealth, money that we are already paying for, right? And instead, redirect it to the public treasury and take just five billion of that and hand it to the Seattle public school system. That would be equivalent of over a hundred thousand dollars per student. Really think about the level of education that we could provide to our students if we actually put our money where our mouth was and just took a quarter, just a quarter, of publicly created wealth that we create every single year and have to pay off the private landowners and instead redirect it to our school system. But think think of the level of education that students could have. You could have that state of the art detention center that holds the students in place with magnets. No, we could do even better. We could have we could we could have every classroom have a, a, no more than ten students per teacher. We could have those teachers educated with a master's or, or higher level. We could pay the current teachers to go to grad school and get that level of education. We could build enough schools that no child would be more than a fifteen minute walk away from a school at any point in time. Throughout, throughout the entirety of Seattle. You could staff those schools with after-school activities going well into the evening hours, providing all kinds of resources for them. Think of all the labs and, 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 and the extracurricular activities and sports and the arts and humanities that we can fund with this. And that's all well and good. And that's very fun to think about, about what we could have and the kind of education you could have. But I think it's actually really interesting when you think about it paired up with UBI, just one. Um, so if you just took 10%, Okay, we still have plenty left over after this quarter. If you took 10% of what you could capture from land value tax, spread it evenly among the 750,000 people in Seattle, that comes out to about $2,700 a year, okay? Which is not nothing, that's a good amount. But what I like to think about is the fact that 
you know, that, that's all 750,000 people. So that includes kids, right? Now we can't trust a five-year-old with $2,700 a year, right? So let's just take that and put it aside into a savings account, right? Let it sit there. Don't touch it until they're 18 years old. And if we assume that land rents grow at about 5% per year, which hint, they grow far more than that, but at a very, very, very conservative estimate under current zoning, assuming none of that changes for the next 18 years, what you would get is a child walking into adulthood with a $75,000 savings account after going through over a decade of education where our government spends $100,000 on them every single year. Think about what sort of society-wide, economic-wide changes that would have, right? After being given that level of education and that much of a starting fund to work off of into adulthood, right? So questions about what we could have. So I got two questions. Um, I, I missed a, a point. This this thing you were talking about just now mm. that was not the revenue neutral version. No, right? no, that was a, that was just yeah. yeah. You could by raising more taxes, you could do good things with it. That's the turbo charge. Yes, turbo mode. Yes, land that was that was if you if you raise okay. land value taxes by a lot more. When you're talking about land revenue neutral, just funding what we have right now, yeah. you would be able to pay for that. Okay, so it. sorry that was sorry if that was a bit misleading. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any any other questions? I so I actually wanted to um, if I can be greedy. Uh, yeah, it, for sure. I was wondering if you had some sort of in, intuitionistic explanation uh, for the chart about um, uh, for single family homes. Um, I was wondering if there was some intuition you had around. Th this is just a super weirdly bimodal graph. Like yes. one is you know really skinny, and then you've got this really steep drop off and then a long yeah yeah so you can kind of split this up i mean this is somewhat off the hip you would have to actually i'd have to actually look into the data to confirm this but given what we know about land use restrictions in seattle versus other jurisdictions this is a pretty normal distribution right which tells me that this is probably the areas where land use restrictions are relative to the rest of king county the least restricted right and so this is where you see these are basically Seattle single family homes. And then out here is a combination of those really wealthy ones, like at Yarm Point, and then some other like shoreline or what have you, those other jurisdictions where they have even more egregious land use requirements for having larger lot sizes, larger setback ratios and uh, whatnot. And also like larger parking minimums for business or well, this is single family homes, yes. but like, um, you know, any 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 of those very silly uh, like floor area floor area ratio stuff right um, where other jurisdictions are a lot worse yeah yeah pretty much uh, Suresh we, we have a couple of questions in the chat yeah know. how about we oh, do, okay. do can we do the room first sure. yeah cool sorry uh, go ahead yeah so property tax pretty easy to set the values like when did it sell recently what was that value right I mean obviously things don't sell a little trickier but you have some sort of baseline. Whereas land value tax may be a little harder to value, but what is the value of the land? Oh. Of course, King County has done it, but I'm curious, how would you do that in a way that's fair and reasonably objective? Yeah, so if you want to, so the, the way that King County does it is basically what they do is they look at the whole property and they take the, um, is it the deconstruction value or the construction, one of the two, um, of the building itself, right? And then they subtract that from either what it just recently went for, right? Um, or based on how nearby properties uh, have gone for. This is also another way that you can value um, through some very fancy geospatial regression tools, right? Is it, whenever, whenever you tear down a building to replace it with something for a brief moment of time, that property is empty. And you can value it right there when it's empty. If you want to like really be clear about like how much is this just the dirt itself worth, right? Um, there's also some other auction type uh, evaluations that exist where people can self-assess and then whatever you self-assess at, self at, someone else can buy at that price. So you've got a very upward pressure to like, you know, put it at a price enough, high enough price that like no one's going to try to like call your bluff on that, but then also low enough that like you'd actually pay for it or do something with it to pay for that tax, right? Um, we can talk about victory auctions after that's like a whole other thing. Um, but anyway, that's kind of more or less how King County assesses land sure. value. Um, that makes sense. And yeah. Another question is, I, I worry that if we were to implement this somehow, 
it would then provide a really strong incentive to keep things like single family zoning because otherwise the value of your land goes up more than all yeah. yeah. property. So this is land. this is this is a good point, which um, uh, if you were to do land value tax, people might have incentive to make sure that their their land value is as low as possible, making sure that nothing happens around them. And in that case, um, yeah, that is an incentive. That is a poor incentive. However, hopefully we should be getting people in office who will do what's right for the people and always making sure that, that we're, we should always be building light rail stations. We should always be building schools. And even though uh, there was actually a good example for somebody who's like 60 with no children, if a school goes up nearby, their land value is going to go up, but I don't have any kids that go to that school. Well, there might be hospitals being built nearby, which would help them. So their land value actually is rolled into what's useful for them. It's on the grand scheme of things, a light rail station going in nearby you is good. A hospital going nearby you is good. A grocery store is good. And that's going to raise your land values. And just because one thing doesn't help you doesn't mean that the other things won't. So we should always be making things better for- Yeah, everyone. I mean, if I were a scheming homeowner, right? The first thing I do is landmark my home so nothing can ever change. And my land value goes to zero, or not zero, goes to whatever the property value of my property is because nothing can ever change about it, right? No one can ever build anything on it. Maybe improvements can happen nearby, so that will increase the land value. Mm. But you can't build a tower from it. You Absolutely. Can't, you can't do anything. Yep, and that's just something that you have to make sure that is being trying a lot that they can't. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Colton. Yeah. Who makes this reality? Is this like a voter initiative? Is this like a legislative yeah. body that votes upon this? So, like, with depends on how you want to go about it, I guess. Right. If we did, if we went through the MFTE route, this would yeah. require a vote of the legislature. That would yeah. be a simple 50 50. If we were to get like in county level or uh, at the state level. So, yeah. if we were to make um, income taxes legal, um, we would be able to piggyback on that movement and actually get MFTE to work for this. So then can do a little bit more. Oh yeah, because uh, the, the thing that makes income taxes illegal also makes land value taxes illegal, right? So like you get to kill two birds with one stone there. But um, the actual person or the, the actual legislative body that raises these taxes is at the county level, right? So ultimately it's kind of up to them for implementation, but it's the state legislature that empowers them to do that more or less. Um, yeah. Yeah, my, my question was basically the same. It was about, are these MFTs, can you do them just at the county level or does it need state legislation? But I guess the, the, the efficacy point of this is that I think constitutional changes are almost impossible to get. Yeah. What you might want to go for is you want counties to be given the legal right to adopt MFTE if they want to, but make it a full land tax one. So basically they can exempt all improvement values if they want to. Mm -hmm. And you, you can probably get that through the state legislature because it's like, it's states' rights, but, but you can do that at the city level, actually. With MFT, unless someone corrects me on that. So there's there's city level implementation of MFT, right? Yeah. Okay. So then you can do it at the city level. You can make it um, all zone, all zones. I don't know. Yes. Is that? I'm not sure what the limitations are. Yeah. There, there. I'm pretty sure there are some limitations on what you can. I don't know if you could apply MFT to like parking lots, um, but you could. I'm pretty sure apply it to pretty much all multifamily buildings. Apply to. So you could at least do that. Um, which would be a lot, don't get me wrong. Yeah. All right, we can take some, let, let's do, actually let's do on the computer first because we can talk at the bar afterwards if you want, if you guys have more questions. So uh, who's who's on the call? I think Christian had a couple of questions. Christian? Christian, you want to come up mute and ask him your questions? <laughs> I can yeah, just, uh, yeah, I asked them in the, um, in the chat, but um, they're not super important, so I'll, yield to the next person okay it's more about like modeling and future calculations stuff like that yeah we still have all the um the data so we can do more uh projects if anybody has any questions with that yeah, yeah. uh anyone else on the chat on the, on the call i think i'm i'm looking through here those actually were the only two questions okay all right, we can take from the room again. Uh, you had a question back there. Sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, Santa first. <laughs> so, did you look at the choice of the case at all to see like how they kind of work it through to get like public approval for this? Because yeah, they were looking at a couple of years. Yes. Back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Detroit. So the mayor of Detroit has done a lot of great work with this. It's very similar type deals, revenue neutral, right? Um, in Detroit, though, uh, they see 97% of homeowners actually see a tax decrease. That kind of makes sense. Detroit doesn't have a lot of speculative value like Seattle does, relatively speaking here. Um, and so there's a lot less money involved in the land speculation business, which is why more homeowners uh, would see a tax decrease, right? They see 97% 
Yeah. The homeowners decrease and it's revenue neutral. Yeah. How yeah. is that possible? Who are the three percent? I'm I'm telling you, they like it's it's just a fact of that you know it's it's not so much about Detroit as it is about Seattle, because like Seattle, San Francisco, any major city that's seen explosive growth over the last decade or so, or just any time, right, um, will see a very large increase in land values. A lot of it's speculative, right? Um, that we all have to cop up whenever we want to do anything. So um, the way that they've done it, to answer your question, though, it's been through a buy-in through the Michigan State Legislature. Their constitution is a lot less popular than ours is. So um, it's easier to do a land value tax. The way that they're doing it is a split rate. So they're not totally getting rid of improvements. What they're doing is they're significantly reducing the rate on improvements and then offsetting it by an increased rate on the land itself. And also, politically speaking, it's much more popular there because Detroit has a very long history of these uh, parking lot owners and vacant lot owners that just sit on their land, do nothing with it, and the city has to spend a lot of money on maintenance and upkeep of those, you know, vacant lands, and it's been pissing off the people there, reasonably so, because you got people that are profiting off of all of their hard work, right, and like, no one wants that, um, so there, there's a lot more of a drive there politically for something like this, um, here, you know, uh, it's a very urbanist town, but, um, and generally down for progressive taxation, but different, different vibe. Um, anyway, I won't go on to that tangent, but yeah. Allison? Yeah, I just was wondering sort of about like small businesses, because I can I can see that anyone who like owns an apartment building is a winner. Mm -hmm. But like, let's say I'm a small business in a super dense, valuable neighborhood like Ballard or downtown. Uh, like, do I see more of a tax burden under property taxes uh, or land value? It sort of depends. So if you are a small business owner, on the bottom of like if it's like a seven over one or a five over one where there are apartments above you you split the tax between all of you guys and they all win and that's the that's growth that we're trying to encourage under land value tax whereas if you're a one-story small literally physically small business with a big parking lot yeah your taxes are probably going to go up but in um in terms of uh the data um that's a little bit harder to measure because it depends on um because there are in in downtown, for instance, like a small business might be on the bottom of a uh, of the Columbia Tower. The, I don't think there is one, but that would be an example of a big building, and they pay very little in taxes. So it just sort of depends on what's going on, literally on top of you. Um, so we would need to that would be yeah, a Dix is a great example. Dix would yeah. see their tax go up probably. most definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, hot mamas. That's it. <laughs> but if, they could just sell the parking lot. Though, but it, right? yeah, so yeah. if 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 Dick's Burgers, for instance, if Dick's Burgers did want to, um, you know, do use their land more, act, well, they would. Yeah, uh, we would relax the zoning there so that they can build a large apartment building on top or someone else, and we would have possibly right to return mm -hmm. laws, which would mean they could have the first slot at the bottom of the new apartment building, right. and then their taxes would for them specifically would go down. Yeah, of course, most businesses don't own the business space that they're in. I don't know about right. Dick's, but so like mm -hmm. if you're renting your business, like the, the rent would probably stay the same-ish. Depends. Depending I know on that's an awful answer. Other stuff. If, you're, if you're a tenant, you can be strictly good off because um, yeah. you can't pass on the land tax. Yeah, but removing the tax on improvements means you'll get more full space built right. and rent should go down. Yeah, so it should actually be the most right. Because right. right. it's the historic institution. We've got so <laughs> <laughs> oh, did yeah. they use the room for a music video? Yeah, exactly. That was pretty yeah, cool. I thought that was in a Wallach Yeah, yeah. Actually, two music videos. Not so oh, no way. Right. No, but that is a really good point about like more commercial space because like this parking lot right out here under a land tax, yeah, you can say goodbye to it. Like that shit's not existing, right? Like you would have to, whoever owns it would have to build something with it or they would bankrupt themselves trying to hold on to a parking lot, right? And so from that, if, if they really utilize it, you get more housing and ideally if zoning permits, probably more commercial space. More commercial space means more businesses, yeah. more rents, right? more jobs, more jobs. Yeah. So, um, but then we don't get to see a beautiful view of the parking lot. Any more questions? Yeah, dude. Not to sound mistrusting, but uh, you mentioned that implementing a land value tax would actually decrease the land value. Hmm? Did I? Didn't, did you say that? I might have said it would decrease the price. The price. That's what it does. Yes. Okay. But not the value. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you'd be taxing land rents, not. Yes. So, okay. I'll just very, because uh, I, oh, there it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like the price of land, this is, this is 
very simplified, but this is the core of it, okay? The price of land is basically what you think you're gonna get out of it minus how much it's gonna cost you to hold on to it for the time you wanna get something out of it, right? So in, in, in a world where the example that I gave was that if you put land value tax rate at 100% you fully captured the land value, well, then land value equals costs. So we're talking like the same thing minus the same thing equals zero. And so this seems a little counterintuitive and it, so, so, so the price, right, would go down, but the value of the land is still there and that is still taxable. It's kind of like how you can imagine if, um, if, if buying, if someone offers you a job somewhere and you need a bike to get there, right? And if like the extra income you get from that job is like $5,000 a year, right? That $5,000 a year, assuming you're only willing to do it by bike, is the most you'd be willing to spend on a bike. And let's say you're only willing to do that job for like five years. Okay, so the most you'd be willing to spend on a bike is $25,000. Nice bike. Right, very nice e-bike, okay? But if the government says, we're gonna tax you for however much that value that bike is, you don't need to know the price, right? For them to tax you, they would just tax you $5,000 a year and you would not be willing to pay anything. You wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be willing to pay a price for that bike, just the extra income that you get from riding that bike to that new job paid every year. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Might've overcomplicated. So probably, but... then a follow-up question is yeah. how are you calculating land rent? Because the, what we do for assessment right now is yeah. as far as I'm aware, calculate prices. We calculate uh, value and then immediately rolled up into price. Okay, interesting. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's what's reported, right? Um, because that is based on how, on average, how long people tend to hold onto a plot of land. And the plot of land is, this is where we kind of get a little more complicated with this. Um, the price the price of land is uh, that land value rolled up over however many years on average, someone's gonna hold onto that plot of land. It's called capitalization rate. Um, and that's what makes some, a plot of land that has like $5,000 in land rent, if they're gonna hold on to it for 10 years, now it's worth $50,000. And that fifty thousand is what's reported on Cape Cal. Huh. Does the county apply different cap rates to different property types? Uh, they do. I'm pretty sure. If you look through the King County property tax assessment documentation, they mention that, um, and it's based on previous increases, right? Because that's that's kind of what determines the capitalization rate. Is how much does the value of the land change from year to year, um, among other things? But uh, yes, that is accounted for. Um, yeah, usually for context, it's like 10%. On average, that's how long people hold on to land is for 10 years. Yeah. All right, more questions? Anyone on the call? No, thanks. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.